and we re really focus on like what we like to do. We like working outside in pastures and I like direct marketing and I really don't like driving tractors and working outside <laughs> in the cold. So <laughs> it just doesn't make sense for me to do that. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversation podcast where we talk about all things related to ranching by connecting you to peer ranchers and industry leaders to improve the profitability of your operation and your lifestyle. Now, if you are looking for a community of ranchers, sign up for my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are mastermind events for ranchers. You join a Zoom link and you sit down and have a conversation with other ranchers and industry leaders about specific topics that help you improve your operation and face the challenges that we face as an industry as a whole. Now, if you want immediate ranch management advice, go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com slash newsletter and sign up. When you sign up, I will send you a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the ranching gurus who have been on my show and poured out their knowledge for all to hear. With that, be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram by following Cattle Convos. You can connect with me there or you can go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com to find anything you may need. I'm excited to meet you and let's get on with the show. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's great to have you on the show. James, you've been on the show before, but today you brought on Brian and Kim to visit with us a little bit today. So I'm going to go ahead and have Brian and Kim, please introduce yourselves and share with the audience where you're located and what your operation looks like as far as beef production and how you're navigating that. Uh, my name is Brian Maloney. Uh, we have Briley Farms here in Western Quebec. Uh, we are grass fed um, and grass finished operation. We do some custom grazing. Uh, we don't keep any cattle year round. Uh, so we don't have to deal with winter. Um, and I'll let Kim talk more about what she does and how she manages. <laughs> most She does most of the work. <laughs> So yeah, I'm Kim Maloney. I am uh, the fifth generation here at uh, Briley Farms. Um, so yeah, we specialize in intensive grazing management and we also direct market all of our meat uh, directly to our customers from here at our farm store. Uh, we're open on the weekends from Friday on uh, Friday and Saturday. Um, so our business consists of, we finish about 125 uh, steers or heifers every year. Um, we also do 50 lambs and we custom graze uh, 40 cow-calf pairs on about uh, 360 acres of pasture. Um, for our group of finishing animals, we move them four times a day to new pastures. So that's pretty much what I do. I, uh, two and a half hours a day, I'm working with the animals. And then the other time of the day, I'm working on communications, marketing, uh, doing a lot of social media. Uh, we're very passionate about pasture and uh, direct marketing and connecting with our customers. So how long have you been intensive grazing? Um, I started this in the, in the early 90s um, and the, it's always been evolving and still will. Um, the, the hardest part was when we were transitioning from more conventional farming to grazing when we had to make hay when we had to do crops and then go out and do your two and a half hours. So I made the effort early on to eliminate everything else. So that's why we don't keep cattle during the winter time. So two and a half hours a day isn't a lot of chores because that's pretty well all the time it takes. And that's year round because we keep a small flock of sheep over the, the winter is that's what our day consist of we don't have to run sprayers or hay binds or anything like that we're just managing the animals on grass um, most of the days it doesn't even feel like work so with those sheep are you how do you work them into your grazing plan um, so the sheep right now they have their own separate pastures um, we move them to a new piece of pasture every day 
every morning. Um, and the rotations are usually about 40 days. Um, but we came into a few problems with parasites this year. So I think next year we're gonna move them to a different pasture and try and figure out how we can incorporate the beef and the sheep grazing together to have longer rotations and to cut the parasite cycle. Okay. So what has the herd health standpoint looked like for your beef cattle? Have you noticed um, any improvements with rotational grazing or what, what does that management look like for you there? Um, so on, on the health end of it, we don't have a lot of protocols. We make sure that the animals we buy or bring in are all vaccinated. Um, but we've also noticed that, and, and I hate to say this, and I'm going to touch something here, is that um, we don't have health problems. Um, grass is healing. L animals that have no stress aren't normally sick. So we put an environment where these animals really have all they need. Uh, by moving four times a day, uh, they are very familiar with us and the routine. Um, and again, I think that the nutrition in our grass, as we continue uh, getting the organic matter built up on the grass, it's becoming more energetic, more minerals in it. And the animals are, are just, and again, we, we haven't treated an animal in years for uh, pink eye or hoof rot or any pneumonias or anything. And at, at one time we were bringing some animals in that were coming from farms that weren't very healthy. And um, again, just by managing in a low stress, uh, nutritional grass based farm, we made them healthy by the end of the season. And we are very selective on who we purchase our animals from. We don't just buy from an auction sale or anything like that. We really, we know the people that are producing the animals and we're selective on which ones we purchase. So is there anything you're specifically looking for when you're going to these individuals and um, wanting to purchase them to make sure that they fit your operation? <laughs> this, this, is, this is our weak link in our operation in this part of the world. Um, grass genetics is non-existent. We're in uh, an area or in, in this part of the world that everything ends up in a feedlot. Um, and we are really, really um, uh, struggling with finding the right genetics that perform well on a grass only system. So um, I, I encourage uh, other farmers uh, to start looking at, at the genetics differently. Um, up in this part of the world, there's a huge spread between heifers and steers at the market. Um, so we, we buy mostly heifers and we would encourage if we could get the right genetics, we would pay steer prices for heifers if we got the right animals. Um, so we're offering premiums, um, but we're, we're not, there's not a lineup yet uh, for people that want to sell cattle to us yet. Okay. So, you know, you've made the comment that you know, you don't keep them over winter. And you said in this part of the world where like grass genetics are not common. So you're in Quebec. Would you talk a little bit more about what your climate looks like throughout the seasons, how that weather is changing to give the audience a better idea of how you're managing and what you have to manage through when it comes to weather? Um, it's different every year, definitely. We do get, we get a lot of snow in the winter from January, January, February, March. Um, we usually get a pretty wet spring. Um, this year it started off dry um, and then we got a lot of rain uh, closer to the end of May, uh, beginning of June. Um, and then I think July was the most rain that we got, the mm -hmm. month that we got the most rain, which is usually when it's the driest. So it, it changes every year. Um, and then uh, August, September, and October, we got like a moderate amount of rain. And then, uh, yeah. Winters throughout Quebec are 
they can range from mild to severe, um, but there's always a certain amount of snow and there's a certain amount of days that are that will be very cold. And for listeners across North America, um, minus 40 Celsius is minus 40 Fahrenheit and we can get those temperatures for a few days throughout the year. So those days cause the most challenges, which is uh, a great thing that they don't keep the cattle uh, for themselves. Um, it, it really reduces that minus 40 days, heavy snowfall days, not having to go out and do chores uh, and not having to worry about the herd health in those days. And we re really focus on like what we like to do. We like working outside in pastures and I like direct marketing and I really don't like driving tractors and working outside <laughs> in the cold. So <laughs> it just doesn't make sense for me to do that. <laughs> Well, it's important that your business is in line with your purpose, passions, and what you like yeah. to do. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, something we talk about a lot on the show is that it there's a different way to do everything and it's important to do what works for you. So James, would you touch a little bit more on some herd health challenges that maybe producers do face in I would like to say North America, but I know that's too broad. So let's let's narrow it down to kind of some of those northern areas that you're used to. What are some of those herd health challenges? Yeah, so I mean, you'll you'll know a lot of these challenges as well. Um, you know, everywhere from I'd say Montana throughout um, the northern U.S. into New England, uh, and then all of Canada will face a lot of these challenges. Is that in the winter is when you can get a lot of those pneumonias. Um, you can get a lot of um, issues with uh, pregnant cows because a lot of calving happens in the spring. Um, so those herd health challenges can be numerous and never ending, which would take their two and a half hours and potentially turn it into six a day. Um, if they were continuing to uh, leave the cows out there, I know out West um, where they get a lot of cold winds, but less snow, um, they'll be driving hours, miles and kilometers to go and check out their cows that are out bale grazing or uh, frost grazing. And they're, oh, that cow's off by itself. Oh, that cow's still lying down in the whole herd. It's, it's a never ending cycle when you come to herd health in the winter months uh, in Northern climates. So does Gallagher have any tools right now to help producers navigate some of those? Absolutely. I know. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's, there, it ranges from everything from the simplest to the most complex in terms of technology. Um, you know, we have, you know, the most simplest term um, to use for ha checking the health is the weight of the animal. Did they drop five kilos, 10 pounds uh, in a couple of days? Um, are they wasting away? How do they look? Um, you know, Brian always talks to um, groups that we do this with that, you know, that triangle on the left side, I believe, on the left side, is it full? Is it not? Um, are they getting enough food? Um, are they eating enough? Do they look listless? But with Gallagher's products, you can, you can get just the weight and be able to tell, okay, last week they were this, this week they're this, there, there seems to be a problem. I'm looking visually and I see that. Um, all the way up to com complex, I've given this vaccine, they were preg checked at this time, uh, they had foot rot on this. There's data capture technology um, hardware that we sell uh, and that we provide that aid. And then we also have software and apps to be able to discern that data afterwards on your phone, on your laptop, so that you can, from the warmth of your house afterwards, not out in the field, be able to check on okay, this cow looks like there's an issue. I better bring her into the barn. Well, thank you for sharing that. So Kim, there is a lot we could talk about with what you've got going on as far as marketing the beef and what that looks like. So can you explain a little bit more about that side of your business? Because there are a lot of different ways to do direct-to-consumer marketing as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I use Facebook and Instagram as a main uh, marketing tool to connect with our customers. Um, I like to show like the day in the life of what we're doing on the farm, like moving the cows, moving the sheep, our dog, family life, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, I find like the posts that do the best are like the ones about us, like working, like 
stuff we like to do and not necessarily like selling the meat. Of course, sometimes I try and like sell some stuff, but I really try and uh, show who we are uh, through social media. And that really, I find consumers are really looking for, to connect to the farmer, to connect with the people that are producing the meat. And uh, it's working really well for us. We've been increasing our sales every year. And that's my goals for the future is to continue doing that and uh, yeah, increasing our numbers and getting to know our customers. So with that, do you, did you mention that you have a storefront or is it all online? What does that look yeah, like? Yeah, we have a, our farm store that's open on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, that's opened uh, from like March until December. And then we open for just one day a week during the winter time. Uh, but the bulk of our production is of course, when the grass finished beef starts to get finished in the fall. So we sell, um, the majority is quarters and halves of beef uh, starting now until the end of November. But we okay. sell yeah, individual pieces, sausages, uh, transformed products um, in our farm store as well. The, the thing that um, should be mentioned is that their, their farm where we are right now is right off of a main highway. So people can see it from the highway. People can see that it's part of this region to uh, to stop in for agritourism. So it's uh, it's an easy stop for people if they just want to go have a picnic or something and grab some meat on their way. So do you do a fair amount on the agritourism side um, as far as farm tours or allowing people onto your operation or anything like that? Yeah, if anyone, we do offer farm tours if somebody wanted to come check out the cattle or, or the sheep or anything. Um, we used to have a wedding venue, which we are sitting in right now. <laughs> uh, but after COVID, we stopped doing weddings and uh, we're still trying to figure out what we're going to use this venue for, which it could be agritourism in the future, but we're still trying to figure that out. But we're always, we always welcome anyone uh, here at the farm. Well, I think that's great. Has there been any like one misconception or one misunderstanding that consumers have come to you about wanting and as far as it relates to beef like is there one clear one that you've ever had to clear up or does it kind of depend on the person uh, there, tough questions. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is there, there is a non-realization that how important ruminants are in going changing the, the climate um, and, and I bring it back to the really only story that makes sense to me is when there was 60 million bison on the planet, the CO2 levels were way, way lower than they are today. The ruminants are not the problem. It's the people and the industry and the transportation. Yes, agriculture has evolved, um, but ruminant agriculture done correctly uh, in a pastoral system is definitely part of the solution. And, and honestly, people really, really want to know this and they appreciate their purchases even more once they understand that they are becoming part of the solution by buying these types of products. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I ask that because I enjoy advocating and sharing about the beef industry. So I was curious about what you had heard, but when I look at you know, the beef industry and ruminants themselves, I really enjoy sharing on that point that you just touched on is how great they are for the environment, how they can be when used correctly in pastoral systems and proper grazing strategies, the amazing things they can do for our world. And I think that's something that we need to do a better job of communicating. So is there anything else that you can either of you would really like to touch on, you've brought a unique perspective onto my show before. I've never had grass finished producers on here. So I do really enjoy your perspective and hearing about that. But, you know, we've touched on how you bring in cattle, kind of why you made that change, um, the herd health side of it, how you market your animals. But is there something you'd really like to send home with my audience and these listeners as they wrap up listening to this episode? For, for me, I, I see, because I work with a lot of 
different producers and you know, I've started up quite a few grazing groups and clubs um, throughout the province. And I see so many opportunities as we kind of take the blinders off and start looking at ranching that first of all suits us, that makes our life easier and pleasant every day, uh, where it doesn't like, I don't even like using the word chore anymore. You know, it's more, it's, it's just, yeah, we get to be out there with the animals and we extremely uh, enjoy what we're doing. And, and looking at the profit end of it, it's like, if we're not making money at this, we can't do it for very long. Um, and, and, and I think that the business aspect of it has to be brought back into, yes, we have to be passionate about what we do, but we have to make this that the only reason there can be a fifth generation is because the fourth generation made money doing this. And we have to, we need a whole lot more young ranchers to take over that are happy and become wealthy also during their lifetime. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, for me, I think uh, for consumers to really uh, look around them, like there's so many farms, there's so many local places around to buy vegetables, to buy meat, to buy eggs, rather than going to the grocery store, just look locally, um, especially for us, at least in our area, right during COVID, our sales peaked really high. And then we kind of just like, we're coasting that, the, our sales kept going up. And then I find now it's just, uh, it takes a lot more effort. It takes a lot more like new things, new, uh, trying to get more customers to come. Um, so yeah, I find, yeah, if customers could continually support local and find ranchers that are making a difference um, in the environment and producing them in a, in a good way. Well, supporting local businesses of all kinds is very important for rural communities. So that's a great message. James, do you have any final thoughts you would like to share? Absolutely. Um, you know, depend, regardless of how you want to capture data, um, Brian does it all in his head. Kim made him write it all down. <laughs> um, it's, it's important to have a plan. It's important to have those data points, um, whether it's herd health, um, you know, uh, statistics, data points. It's important for you to capture that to Brian's point. If you don't know what's happening on your farm, you might not be profitable and there might not be a next generation. So to be able to not only plan for the future, but also understand your past is extremely important for ranchers everywhere. Thank you. As we've said before, you can't manage what you don't measure. So exactly. it's important to know where you've been and where you're at and where you want to go. Well, thank you to all three of you for joining the show show today and sharing your perspective on raising beef cattle and caring for the environment as well as taking care of herd health. I really appreciated this new perspective on the show. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.